Hi, my name's Emily. I'm one of the organisers of Leeds LGBT Plus Book Club, um, and I'm joined today by Luke Turner. Luke, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Hiya, uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, I am a writer, although it still feels strange saying that. Um, uh, based in London, I started off writing about music and I run a website called The Quietest mu online music magazine. Um, but last year I published a book called Out of the Woods, which is a memoir about forests, humans relationship with nature, uh, growing up in the 90s, religion, uh, bisexuality, recovery from sexual abuse, sexual compulsion, loads, loads of stuff all in one not that big book. <laughs> but yeah, so thanks very much for ha having me to come and talk about it today. No, that's all right. Um, so one of the things I noticed about the book uh, when I read it the first time was um, it's non-sequential, so it starts kind of now-ish, and then it kind of bounces between your younger self um, and kind of the journey towards now and then it can kind of comes back to the present day and, and bounces back around a little bit was that was that intentional was it a deliberate decision to do it that way um yeah I think it just ended up ended up happening that way partly because the book was never supposed to be about me at all it was supposed to be about this amazing forest Epping forest um which is over there somewhere uh, over there out of my window. Um, it was going to be about the social history of Epping Forest and um, and the natural history. Um, so the chronology would have been completely different, just this sort of going back from the Ice Age to, to the modern day. But then gradually my own story sort of started coming into it quite a lot. And, and I think if you tell a story, a memoir, cr chronologically, I kind of think famous people can get away with that because you know they've they've done something so you're kind of reading it going i want to know about what led to them doing the thing that i i i, I like them for and then you get to the bit that you like them for and then after that they can get a bit boring because you're not as into what they do um but because i'm not a famous person and no one no one would give give a toss what i've done i think it had to jump around to be like why are we hearing this person's story so it kind of made sense to weave all sorts of different things in and then go back to explain um you know to, to, to sort of illustrate what, what what had happened and also I think you know one of my real beliefs is you know everything is shaped by the past you can't escape your, the past whether that's in actual history or your personal history and the book is a, a sort of way of of looking at, at that how those narratives work personal and wider narratives within ecology and history. Quite a lot of the book is dedicated to your teenage years um, there's quite a lot packed into that um, kind of time but as you already mentioned, um, you grew up in the 90s and uh, uh, in particular, um, growing up during Section 28. Um, I was wondering if you could read a passage from the book for us about that. That's all right. Yes. Yeah, so, OK, so this is a bit, maybe I'll set the scene slightly. And I was a very geeky teenager, didn't really have many friends at school. Uh, I was once in WH Smith's and I was reading one of my favourite aeroplane magazines and I heard some laughing and I looked up and there was a load of girls my age pointing at me going, ah, because I was reading an aeroplane magazine. So I, I was quite I was quite geeky, but I had this sort of secret in that I kind of fancied men and girls and it was all complicated. And I'd had a bit of a furtive experience, shall I say, uh, with a friend uh, under the desk in chemistry lessons, uh, which I write about in um, the book. And so that was quite a formative experience, um, but also it was quite um, difficult to process, largely because of what was going on um, in the wider society around sexuality at the time. So I'll read a bit now about, about what it was like to be sort of somewhat sexually undecided in the 90s. Back in the early 1990s, sex education in schools was woeful for heterosexuals, let alone for gays, lesbians, and especially those somewhere in the middle. We were shown diagrams of the reproductive organs and lectured about contraception. There was the constant implication that we, as boys, were always wanting sex, whereas women would have to be, as wrong as it now sounds, persuaded into it. The girls in the other single sex state school on the far side of town with a vestal virgins. Sex was never talked about in terms of pleasure. 
it was a reductive education and as hard to deal with as the growing discomfort of knowing that the Bible on my bedside table at home told me that sex, unless sanctified by marriage and between a man and a woman, was a mortal sin. This was a time of tw section of 28, the Tory law that forbade the promotion of homosexuality in schools. I never heard the word gay or homosexual uttered from the mouth of a teacher, let alone any nuanced teaching on the complexity of desire. My school had over 900 pupils, yet in my seven years there I never knew of one out or gay or bisexual pupil. Only the bullying that was directed at anyone vaguely suspected of being a puff. I was lucky I only got picked on for being a bit of a swat and terrible at sport and gradually learned to build up a defense of humor and by forging alliances with some of the tougher kids who didn't fit in. I knew though that if I'd got caught with my hand round Tipex boy's cock, we'd instantly be branded benders, shirt lifters, or one of those other charming, charming terms boys and men use to hide the fear of their own sexuality. The human instinct for binary comfort means that there's no possibility, or at least wasn't then, that a sexual act didn't push you into one camp or the other. One touch of a cock and that was it. You were a pariah who would no doubt have been punished by the school authorities nearly as severely as by your peers. A friend recently sent me a news report about how my school had been deemed inadequate in a 2017 Ofsted inspection, in part because, and I quote, pupils report they do not feel safe in the school and bullying is commonplace. Pupils often make derogatory and homophobic comments to each other and about teachers. It was startling to read. If this was the case in a supposedly more progressive present, then my memory might even have suppressed how terrible it was even a quarter of a century ago. There were no media, cultural or educational voices to offer comfort or wisdom on what, might it, what it might mean to be attracted to both men and women. Aside from deep inside my own secret thoughts, the first time I was even aware of the wider concept of bisexuality was via an AIDS poster. Grimly monochrome, it showed a photograph of two male hands clasped, one with a wedding ring and the other without. The poster asked, do you know who he is having an affair with? Like most government directed campaigns of the time, it fed into the dangerous and homophobic stereotype of HIV as a gay disease spread by feckless promiscuity. But it also marked out bisexual men as equal or perhaps even worse villains, transmitting the virus into the heterosexual norm and rejecting binary constructs of sexuality that society adhered to back then. I was too young and sheltered to have discovered David Bowie or any of the few bisexual role models who, by the early 1990s, were in the public eye and might have helped me see my asexual orientation as normal, nothing to be ashamed of. I loved Queen's Greatest Hits, one of the few pieces of vinyl remaining from the old collection my dad had to sell to pay his way through college. Just as I started to fall in love with the pomp and drama of the music, Freddie Mercury revealed he had AIDS and died the following day. In the conservative Middle England of the 1990s, the epitaph of his sexuality was a dozen chaseless play playground jokes and hyperbolic headlines about disease. I worried about that this might be how I was going to get end up. Were all of us who wanted to have sex with men and women doomed to die of AIDS? So yeah, section section twenty eight pre internet, um, so much much more difficult to be able to find information about things. Um, very minimal, if any, uh, gay and um, bi representation. What what was what was that like? How did you find that? Yeah, it was just very lowly. I mean, it's odd really because I think now you know mentioning Freddie Mercury and and David Bowie, who you know you think of Freddie Mercury as a as a gay man. And David Bowie is a straight man, really, in, in, in many ways. But, you know, neither of them, I, mean, I don't think Freddie Mercury was 100% was, was gay. He was in a relationship with a woman for many years. They were close up until he died. Uh, and that was a sexual relationship. And I know gay men who the idea of having sex with a woman is just kind of impossible. So I kind of think there's a spectrum there. And Freddie Mercury wasn't on the gay end. Bowie definitely wasn't. You know, he... He um, he had sex with men, but you didn't see them like that uh, in the 90s. Um, 
I was a massive fan of suede, though that happened slightly after the events that I'm talking about there. I got into suede when I was about 16, but that was in part because of Brett Anderson's ambiguous uh, comments about sexuality and the way suede dressed and they were kind of quite feminine. And, you know, I think now Brett Anderson would be seen as uh, non-binary and gender non-conforming. Back, back then, he, that, though, that terminology didn't exist in the kind of discourse so he, he just dressed in this in women's blouses and had floppy hair and big earrings and you know and he, he got in a lot of trouble for saying I'm a bisexual man who's never had a homosexual experience and he was sort of mirthlessly taking the piss out for that but as a kid back then that meant a lot to me I was kind of like there's somebody saying I'm a bisexual man I don't care if he's not had a homosexual experience surely that's possible anyway um and it just was like, wow, there is somebody out there who understands sexual fluidity in a way that, you know, you just, you just, I just can't think of any, anywhere else where I, where I would have heard about it as, as a concept. I mean, sometimes I think, oh, queer, queer as folk came along and that was a radical thing with, with an aspect of bisexuality in it. But that, that wasn't actually on the telly till 1999 or something. It was quite a lot later. So back then there, there just wasn't really anything that I saw or was, or was allowed to see in any case. Um, and, and what about what about now? Is that representation still important to you? Do you do you need that? Do you not need that? Do you do you? How does it feel when you see people being um, out and proud now as bisexual in the media? I still think there's not enough to be to be frank. I I still think we're not discussed. I think there's been a huge um, advance in in discussion of trans rights in recent years and that's that's been absolutely necessary and I'm glad it's happened I still think bisexuality hasn't had its moment of being properly discussed to be honest I think mainly be, perhaps because it's easy for bisexual people to pass in whatever way they are maybe it's a less of an ex existential threat than it is to gay or trans people um to to, to not be able to be out I, I, maybe, maybe it's seen as being a less urgent discussion but I don't I don't think it is as common. I do, I do think there's a generational thing that maybe kind of for people coming through now as teenagers, there is more discussion going on. There's more access to information and people are more fluid in that generation. But then that bit I read about my school in 2017 and the homophobia there, I'm sometimes, I, I, I sometimes think is, is the sort of discussion we have about fluid sexuality that applies to, yeah, maybe in big cities and enlightened schools on the internet but what's the reality in small town conservative England I'm not convinced it is as good so I think we need a lot more discussion uh, about bisexuality I still don't see a huge amount of writing or films or, or anything uh, dealing with bisexuality maybe more dealing with female bisexuality male bisexuality I still feel is is, is very quiet I, I, I kind of I want, I want there to be more discussion of it. I want there to be more accurate representation of, of, of it. Um, and and, and I, I still don't think there's enough. It's changing, but I, I still feel like I'm one of the few people maybe writing and talking about it. I really liked how you, you take the reader through a journey of, um, I mean, you, you talk about your bisexuality from the very beginning in the book, um, but even even though it jumps around in your timeline there's a very feel there's a feel of in the beginning of a book um you're not necessarily comfortable with that as a label or you're trying to find your balance um is that's how i read it anyway i'm not sure if that was how you felt um but then towards the end of the book um that seems to change and there is definite progression and um kind of more more ownership of it as that as a label i think um would, would you agree is that is that how you think it, it worked? Yeah, I think so. I think because of the start of the book was just this very traumatic time of trying to work everything, trying to actually finally go, I need to work out what this is, because I think it's a very common thing for bisexual people to, to be, because we're told we, we, we're not, we, we don't exist by the straight world doesn't like to talk about us because it finds us threatening gay world is often just as unhelpful by saying oh it's a phase they sort of gay world is there going come to us no you're just oh come on it doesn't really exist you're just you're oh your parents are religious oh you're just massively repressed and it and it's really i, I think in terms of internalized uh self-loathing i do think bisexual people have it really badly i think 
I think the bi internalized bi erasure and, and bi phobia is, is very powerful. And unfortunately, that comes from gay culture as much as uh, it does straight culture. And I think that maybe, maybe the people would think that's a bit much, but I, I actually think it did for me come um, as much from gay culture because you're just constantly thinking am i just a repressed homosexual am i am i just you know i just on that the way to being a gay man and it took a lot of thinking to kind of work out that wasn't actually the case and i i'd even think you know is bisexual a helpful term because that's still the binary you know even though i've used it a lot we've been using it this is the uh, <laughs> the bi fest and so on sometimes I think you know maybe it's not a helpful term because it's you're still kind of going one to the other one to the other uh, and actually it's better to see it as a sort of fun and messy thing in the middle um so yeah I think I, I've definitely come to a better position with it but I it's still something that will always be thought about you know and and I talk to a lot of people particularly as, as lesbian or gay but actually they, they start to think am I really you know I, I feel attracted to men or women and and maybe I'm not actually gay and I, and I think this is the radical thing that I hope for in the future is that we end up in a position where we really get rid of these binary terms and everything is I mean that's why I think the revival of queer as a term is brilliant because that to me is is, is slippery and fun and and and, in, and enjoyable and it, it it's more representative i think of how a lot of us feel is that we can't it's it can depend on the the wind direction you know or the weather or something or who you've just seen or or, or some art you've you've encountered as to how your sexual preference feels and i mean i don't know I, it's, i've gone through my life feeling thinking fuck it'd be brilliant to be just straight just not have to think about it or just gay and just be like i'm a gay man brilliant i can just plow on in that furrow who <laughs> were um <laughs> but um, but but you know i i can't do that because that's not me i have to constantly be thinking about where uh, about all this stuff and i think a lot of people do as well oh no i absolutely i um over the last few couple of years i've really come to it i like the term queer i know a lot of people don't like it um for very good reasons but for me it, it has a nice feel about it yeah i think so yeah um so i was hoping to go on to talk about some of the well, not that it's been liked so far um i was hoping to talk <laughs> about some of the heavier issues in your book if that's all right we yeah. them. is that okay yeah. today? okay so there's a few topics um in your book that you cover um that are quite a bit heavier you talk about um mental health issues including depression um and suicidal thoughts do you, do you think that's a, an important story for you to have told yeah, I mean, I, if I was right about myself, I had to put them in because that's part of who I am. Um, I also think that there's a there's an incredible loneliness in if you're having issues around mental health and sexual identity or sexual behaviour patterns or or experiences of abuse, and it, in that loneliness is is a lot of self destruction and isolation. Um, and I felt it was important to to bring this stuff up so that people could see there was this that they weren't alone with it. Um, I think, you know, I don't think it's right for every writer to be expected to to do that. But I sort of felt that I probably could could manage it well enough um, to be able to not put myself at risk by doing it. Um, I think that's important to remember for people who are writing that you know, in this we live in a very confessional age. Um, and there's a lot of, particularly for women or, or marginalised people, there's often pressure from editors and things to put more and more of yourself and tell your true story. But actually, you need to be careful as, as, as writers to, uh, if anyone out there is writing about themselves, that you, you are right with it. And I, I felt I was comfortable with it. And I felt that by telling my story then and being honest about the mental health and the suicidal thoughts and things, then that might well help other people um process uh things and also it's a bit of a there's a certain amount where you're kind of saying well all you people who are prejudiced out there this is what you do to to us you know whether that's conservative people the bad end of religious uh people even some 
you know to message to the gay community to the gay male community this is what this is how you make us feel when you're when you're when you're erasing us and when you're constantly putting us through this turmoil so it was a, it was a bit of a kind of it, it was it was both a sort of a thing of trying to share but also a bit of a like angry message <laughs> to people as well i think I think um, often people have said to me that it's, well, it must be, it must be easier being bi. It must be easier because you can pass it straight. Um, it, it's uh, like, like it's an easy thing. Um, and I think it's, yeah, I think it's, it's important to cover those, those issues. Um, I mean, I've, I've looked into some of the research and like incidents of mental health in the bi plus community um, are often quite high. Um, so I think it's really nice, as you said, to have that representation of uh, of a bi man, but also showing some of the other things um, that are related to that as well. Yeah, I think I think the, the the rates for attempted suicide and 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 chronic depression and 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 so on are, are particularly bad in our community, definitely. And and I think because there's so much, so many people have to feel they have to live a bit of a lie, um, and and not they can't come out to friends, family uh and so on and 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 that's all loneliness is always going to be appalling and 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 having a double life is always going to be appalling for your mental health there's just no way around that because you're not being your your true self um one of the, the other things you talk about in your book is um being sexually abused as an underage teenager um again i i'm, I'm sure you would agree that's a really important story to tell um, um again one of the stats that i found was that um bi plus boys are 10 times more likely than their straight counterparts uh, to report abuse um wow that's, so that's i didn't realize that that's... It, yeah it's it's happening but it's something that's not really talked about much um i think often statistics like this can be lost within the wider um particularly lgb community um, I think people often lump lesbians and bisexual women and gay, gay and bisexual men together and report statistics like that. Um, so I think I think it's really helpful not just to have the statistics, but to have the stories there as well. Yeah, I mean, it was that was the hardest bit of the book to to write because it was obviously extremely traumatic experience and one that I didn't really realized was abuse until very late in in life i was you know which is i think why you, that statistic is you just mentioned the, the incidence of abuse for by boys being so high i think that's that's very telling because i think you, you're off feel like it's a rite of passage or you know that's what happens there's so much literature which is all you know it, was, it was normalizes and even in gay literature to be honest that normalizes sex between teenage boys and older men um and there's obviously been that over historically there's been that equation of paedophilia and pederasty with homosexuality which is obviously awful but i think worrying about that equation has stopped us having a really honest discussion about the level of abuse that exists um in the lgbt community um and you know and i think it's happened to a lot more people than let on i mean i i i now have a therapist who specializes in dealing with victims of abuse and she's you know she's there's the numbers are shocking um compared to what what we actually know about from what what's what we think about and i think again this is a this is a such a taboo subject that's just not properly discussed we we we've been we've been moderately good in britain at sort of talking about operation yew tree and 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 the sort of bbc scandals and some of the pop star scandals and me too but this is all very celebrity focused I, and and i my concern with it is that within Within this, there's actually these the, these kind of very ordinary predators who are on, particularly on the internet now, or in as they used to be in town centres, and in, in you know most people are abused by people they know. Uh, so in w whatever groups that would be, schools, families, and so on. And and I think there's, there's sometimes the focus on celebrity misdeeds, 
kind of eclipses the fact that the the, the ordinary predators are, are out there and very dangerous and, and very well concealed. Um, and I think we need a lot more discussion and probably a lot more research into it. I just don't know. I don't think there's a huge amount of research. There are very few organisations helping people. I always always say, you know, if people want to have help with this, um, Survivors UK is a is only been going for a short amount of time, but they do really good work. And and you know, I read their testimonies, and you, I even now at forty one, having written about it all, sometimes I read these testimonies, and people's stories just make me cry because you suddenly see somebody go, who's gone through this this horrendous thing that they didn't even realise was abuse, but yet has led them into appalling states of mental health and behaviour patterns that are deeply unhealthy. And and it's only now we're really starting to hear these stories. So I would say to anyone who feels, you know, this stuff can be very triggering to, to do check out Survivors UK. They're an incredible, incredible charity. Um, and then my last question, if that's all right. Um, so what are you what are you up to now? Is there any projects you're working on? Anything that you mentioned you're still writing or is lockdown pretty much just let's get through lockdown and then see what happens? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the great theory is, is all this time, you know, it's amazing for writers, you've got all this time to uh, to uh, write, but it, that's, it's, to me, it, seem, it seems like a bollocks theory in that we have got all this time to fill with dread, anxiety, con uh, uh, about the worst crisis that we've faced <laughs> for, for, for decades. But um, with, I mean, I'm writing, the next book I'm writing is about masculinity and sexuality in World War II in Britain and about how it was a lot more complicated than we see it as and that actually there was a lot of sexual upheaval and a lot of men acting out their true bisexual selves in the war and also looking at the motivation of men to fight and ideas of what is heroism and bravery and it kind of all connects to what I think what's happening now with we're in this sort of time that's totally ruled by a weird jingoistic sense of british nationalism and a, a pining for the second world war as this 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 time of um kind of simple truths and and heroism and i'm sort of saying well no it wasn't simple like that it was a very complicated time and i want to honor the lives of the men who fought in the war and um were these sort of simplistic characters that the kind of brexit types would have us believe but, you know. that sounds really exciting I look forward to that um, any any idea when it might be out well technically it's supposed to be 20, uh, 2022 but I think everything's just all up in the air and all books are delayed so I, hope, I think I get an extension so I, the moment, I need to go into archives and read people's diaries and all this sort of stuff and you just can't do anything at the moment so um, just reading I'm reading lots of really depressing newspaper stuff which just shows how kind of sexist and racist everything was it's the interesting thing like bisexual if you search for bisexuality in the british newspaper archive which has millions of pages of newspapers from the period 1939-45 the only men mentions of bisexuality are about um say snails having two genders or or hawthorn plants having male and female flies flowers Bisexuality, as we know it, just did not exist as a concept. Um, homosexuality um, was seen not as a... Um, they're, they're sort of pleased with themselves, a lot of the, the scientists I've been reading, because they're very pleased with themselves. They say, we no longer see this as a perversion, but they still see it as a deviant. So homosexuality is written about with um, indecent exposure, fetishism, and, and so on. Uh, it's still seen as abnormal and something that needs to be fixed. And then bisexuality is by these kind of very eminent um, psychiatrists and experts in sexual medicine. Bisexuality is seen as being the homosexual man in denial. Mm -hmm. um, so the homosexuality is a disease, bisexual men are these, you, you know, it, it's, it's kind of mind blowing just how to our eyes, but actually genuinely not just perception, it was how backwards it was. And, you know, we have come a long way in, the intervening years but you you kind of think this this the roots of all these modern prejudices are they're not they're not very old brilliant well thank you for chatting with me um, okay thank and, you um, very much for look forward to your next yeah thank you
Thank Cheers, you very much. Really. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Okay.